Oh, is that not yours? Oh, um, that's the uh, that's what it's the default uh, laptop issued background right there. <laughs> okay. So you don't know what the X is. Yeah, I don't know why uh, it's showing that, but um, maybe I can fix that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, thanks everyone for coming out. I think it's uh, one of the bigger meetups we've had uh, as of late, uh, so I appreciate everyone coming out. <clears throat> uh, tonight, you know, is going to be giving a talk on uh, Wire. Um, don't really have any announcements as far as the Go community is concerned. Um, I think t uh, next month we're going to uh, give a uh, talk on uh, Kubernetes uh, and dynamic instrumentation. Um, I think that's about it. So I guess without further ado, uh, if you're ready. All right, I'm almost ready. Where's the underscan thing? Is, that, is it this? Oh, uh, I never figured thing? that out. Right. I just kind of like moved the window. There's a way to like the newest one, or not the newest, the one before the newest, High Sierra, I think. Yeah, it should have it. Should be here somewhere. Where is this thing? Arrangement? Display? I could try calibrating the monitor if you want. Um, no, I don't worry about it. I'll just uh, just make it so everybody can see the screen. Right. Is that good? Right about there. Okay, so let me get the right side of this window worked out. All right, uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, make it a little bit bigger. Um, uh, my name's Eno. I used to work uh, with Jason and Kira and the other pivotal folks in the room doing lots of Go. <laughs> These days, uh, I'm working at Google as a developer relations engineer, um, working with the Go team kind of in a somewhat official capacity. Um, and anyway, uh, one of the things the Go team has been working on, you know, there's a core team, there's a team that's doing the compiler. Um, there's also a team that's focused on cloud specifically. And one of the, the bigger things that that team is trying to do is help make Go uh, a portable language by default. Uh, and what that means is um, the Go team wants to make it such that when you write Go, you have the ability to de deploy on any cloud and you have uh, a number of shared primitives, um, blob storage, runtime configuration. I mean, the things that if you're going to deploy on a cloud AWS, Azure, GCP, DigitalOcean, whatever, you're probably writing some kind of uh, stuff by hand to invoke the API. Um, the Go Cloud project, which uh, let's see here, maybe some of you are familiar with. Let me show it to you real quick. Uh, hopes to, to take those like shared primitives and um, not Google. Um, <coughs> Extract them to a library that everybody can use. So, what is this all about? Confirm my why. <laughs> Later. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, sorry, folks. Um, yeah. Uh, I knew it was coming. Anyway, uh, Go Cloud. So, um, you know, there's some there's some issues with this. Um, there's problems, but the, the the key objective here is to make help make Go a great portable language across clouds. So, you know, take a look at it. Um, it's like an SDK for the cloud. Yeah, in the cross cloud. So, in other words, it's it's agnostic about the underlying cloud. So, if you're deploying on AWS and you want to be able to have something running on Azure, rather than have to like rewrite a bunch of stuff or you know um, do a bunch of work, the, the hope with Go Cloud is you do some configuration and boom, you're running on Azure. Um, so that's Go Cloud. Um, I've been helping with the team. We got a logo. I had some stickers, but they're not here with me tonight. Um, anyway, so part of that though, and that's the part that I want to talk about tonight is this tool called Wire that um, has been delivered with GoCloud, but really it has nothing to do with GoCloud per se. It's just uh, where you can find it. So uh, the title of the talk here is An Introduction to Compile Time Dependency Injection with Wire. Um, and you know, the first time I heard something like that, my brain kind of exploded because I thought, well, this is why I use Go, so I don't have to think about big complicated words like that. Um, so you might think of this as learn to use wire by example. And so um, because dependency injection has all this baggage that comes with it, I think the most useful way to present this topic tonight is just to do some code together, write some code. So this isn't a super formal talk. It's more of an opportunity for me to take the group through um, like a very straightforward use of wire. Now, uh, wire is a tool. Uh, it solves a problem, the problem being you've written your software with dependency injection, 
you want to, number one, <clears throat> take away some of the pain of new A goes into a new B, which goes into a new C. You know, you can imagine this big dependency graph. If your application is small, you do not need wire. You should write it by hand. Uh, if you have a very large application that has a very complicated dependency graph, and the thought of adding a new dependency in part of the tree and then making sure that dependency propagates down through the tree is daunting to you, wire might be the tool to check out. It might be a nice tool to think about. That's really what Wire is trying to solve. Make it such that uh, generating your dependency graph and changing it is a matter of running a effectively go generate. So um, a little bit of uh, kind of background here. Uh, some of you are probably aware that Uber has a runtime dependency injection tool. Facebook has something else. I forget what the Facebook tool is called. All you know, written go. Uh, it's all runtime based, which means if you've done something a little funny in your code, you're not going to find out about it until it's running. Um, the wire approach that's a little bit different is it's all compile time. So in other words, you run go generate in effect, you get some generated code that we'll look at tonight, uh, and then you get a result that the compiler can then verify. So if you've done something funny, your compiler is going to say, this does not work, don't, you can't go any further. And you know, as somebody who like often lives in uh, fear and loathing of what if something breaks, um, that to me makes me very happy. I want to know about problems before my user reports them. Um, downstream. Uh, anyway, so by the way, here's my email address if you want to reach out, talk about stuff. Um, Google is very interested in making Go a, a successful thing. Uh, I personally, this is my personal opinion, in fact everything I'm really saying tonight is my personal opinion, so if you have complaints, direct them at me, not at this uh, large company that I work for. Um, I view it as Google's investing in not just Go, but the, the, the front range, the Colorado Go community by making space for people who do go here in Boulder. Um, there'll be another um, person joining in a few months or a few weeks who's also a go-focused person. I'm a go-focused person. So, hey, that's cool. You like go, you live in Colorado. Uh, Google thinks that's a big deal and wants to help the go community succeed uh, or do even better, make life better. Um, so, let's get started. Um, I have some links here. Um, if, if you're like me though, you want to maybe look at it later. If you go up to GitHub, I'm Enocom on GitHub. I have a repo called Presentations. Uh, and you can find what we're going to do tonight here, the, the, the finished product with some links. The README runs through documentation, like the actual wire uh, nitty gritty details. There's a tutorial that I've written that is kind of like a alternate version of what I'm going to show you tonight. And then finally, um, some of you might have seen it on the blog recently, uh, Robert Van Gent, who's one of the members of the GoCloud team, uh, wrote kind of like, uh, what is this thing? Why, why is it a thing? Why do we care? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, one last thing, this is kind of like a personal thing, uh, App Engine just released a new runtime, so if you, you're curious about App Engine, uh, it's really great now, you can actually write the Go code that you want. Um, I think it's neat, anyway. So let's get started. So um, we're going to come over here, uh, we have a clean state, uh, I'm going to throw away some stuff, I'm throw away a mod, I'm going to throw away a wire, star. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. Um, for a moment, I wanna put aside like uh, databases, servers, APIs, JSON, gRPC, and all these things that a lot of us are probably thinking of sockets and so on, all these things that we're thinking about, and I wanna write a really simple program. Now, the big asterisk here is this is a simple program. You wouldn't use wire for a simple program. But you know, let's just uh, put that aside for a moment and uh, you know, say here's in a very isolated, small problem space, this is what wire looks like. So uh, tonight I want to write a, um, a CLI, very simple, extremely simple, uh, maybe even a little stupid. Uh, it's just a greeter program. You know, sometimes you've seen some programs that's all about greeters. Well, we're going to write a greeter CLI. Um, and so let's get started. Here's, here's what I'm thinking. Um, we want to have something like this. We want to have a message. Uh, that agree that will give to a greeter, and then the greeter will then be given to an event, and we'll start the event. Um, and the idea here is that this is kind of a very simple simulation of what you might have if you're doing dependency injection in your applications. You know, maybe you're making a database connection that you're then passing to a repository, and then your repository you're passing to a service, and then your service you're then passing to some kind of application server. So you can imagine that kind of like tree. Um, so we're going to do something much smaller than that. So. Let's say uh, we're going to start with a message, which will be welcome uh, Boulder, or welcome to Boulder Gophers. 
That's the name of this meetup. So we'll have such a thing. Um, we're live streaming, Bucky. So uh, you're welcome. You're welcome to sit there, but you might get filmed. All right. So uh, we'll make a message, and then we'll make a greeter. Now, if, uh, if you've been running Go, you've probably written, like when you get started in a new app, this is kind of what your app looks like at first, right? Like it's small, it's nice, and, and things are wonderful, and you're just kind of newing up your things and passing in uh, other things. Uh, new event, which will take a greeter, and then finally start. So that's kind of what our application will look like. Now, um, in my experience writing Go, like I understand that the zero type is supposed to be useful. Uh, in practice though, and this is probably a sign of my being a, a slightly immature gopher, I find that I still need initializers because a lot of the things I'm making uh, can either fail or they have fields that are not exported that I don't want to expose to my users. So I end up making a lot of initializers uh, like this. Um, so maybe, you're, maybe, you're, maybe you have some zero values in your, in your app too, but for now let's just say that we're going to do initializers. So let's do our new message and it's just going to take in a string. Now, uh, because this is uh, an event, it's not going to just be a straight up uh, message. Let's see here. Oops. Uh, it's going to be like a sponsored message or something, right? Like, you know, maybe the string would be fine otherwise. Oops, let's do this. Type message is a struct, and we'll have a value inside it, which will be a string. Uh, I'm using everything private because I'm not even going to think about public packages and so on, whatever. Um, let's make a, uh, a stringer message so we can have a nice way to um, show people stuff and we'll say uh, official message or something like that. Uh, this is a little contrived, but my, my, I'm trying to show you like there's a little bit of like layers of your dependencies here uh, and it's not just a simple string. Oh, whoops, let's just do that. We don't need a new line. All right, so there's our message. Um, let's do a, uh, a new greeter next, right? This is very standard stuff, nothing, ex nothing uh, too surprising here, right? We're building up our dependency graph. So as I'm doing this, think about you know, your database connection, your repository, your service, your API, you know, et cetera. Um, message will be M, and we'll have a greeter type Oops. And uh, what does a greeter have? A greeter has a message field, which is a message type. And let's have a, a message on our, or a, a function on our a method on our greeter that just says greet, for instance, that will return a message. Um, or, you know, let's have it return a string just for simplicity's sake. And we'll say message, turn it into a string. And then finally, we'll have our new event thing. So this is the tedious part that you know you're you're assembling your dependency graph. There's really no way around this um, that I know of, at least. Anyway, so uh, we'll return an event, and it has a greeter, which is a G, and then finally we have our event type and um, greeter field, which is a greeter type, and then finally uh, to finish this all off, we have start, uh, which is just going to return a string. Whoops, no, I don't want to do that. Um, greeter, greet. Right, so you can imagine like some kind of dependency graph. This is a very simple one. So that's what we got. Uh, let's build it, make sure it's happy. Um, we have a couple of problems. It's not a capital S start. Uh, message is not message, it's value. Oops. Oops. All right, so there's our app. Um, and it doesn't even do anything. That's cool. <laughs> let's do this. Oh, here. Let's uh, let's change this into be uh, a, a non-return and say, whoops, this will be a, just a print line. So there's our sophisticated app. It's very cool. It doesn't do much. But again, you can imagine a world where that starts an API server that's got a gRPC API that will connect to a database. It's got a caching layer and, you know, Etc. 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 But here we're here to talk about about dependency injection. So uh, again, this is a small app. It doesn't hurt to write this by hand. Uh, and I think as gophers, we generally like to not pull in external dependencies. We like to do things by hand. We like to understand it. This is easy to understand, easy to uh, change. Now, if this was a huge app, uh, you know, you can imagine like maybe you've seen it. Uh, 
main methods that are 100 lines long or longer, or you know, if it's not in main, it's somewhere. Um, you can imagine that there are, is such code out there. And um, well, one, generating all that code is kind of tough, but again, that's a first time cost. You do that once, you pay the price, you're done. Uh, but then you need to refactor it. You need to add a dependency somewhere in the chain. You want to add like another uh, database connection or another repository somewhere, or another service into your API server. Um, all of a sudden, you have to start thinking, well, that thing, you know, the, the, the service needs to go into this initializer, and then that comes down there, and then I need to pass it into this initializer. And it gets kind of hairy. It's like enough, like I've, I've at least felt the feeling of like, oh, man, do we have to do this refactor? That kind of is like, that's a little tedious. Uh, and that's the problem that Wire's trying to solve, make it very easy to change things. So here's what the world looks like in Wireland. So we're going to make a couple changes. Um, first, uh, we're going to make a new file called Wire. Uh, it could be called anything, but uh, convention as it is, is Wire. Um, and let's have an, a, um, a function called initialize event. Or you could think of this as like set up the world, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to call it initialize event. It's going to return an event. Um, and let's, uh, let's actually use it first so we can see what it looks like. So, whoops, not that. So we might have something like this, um, and there's where our, that's where our E comes from. So build the world and then start the app is really what we have here, right? So this is going to look a little different. This is how wire works. So uh, there's an invocation to wire build, and what we're going to do is, um, let me start here. We're going to return the zero value. If this were a pointer, I could return nil, of course. We're going to have something like this. Now what wire's going to do is, Wire is going to see that we have this function that needs to produce an event. And it's going to look at all the various initializers that we give it. So we'll give it a new message, we'll give it a new greeter, and we'll give it a new um, event. Wire is going to look at all those various um, initializers. It's going to see that you want to build an event, and it's going to be able to sew everything together. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. So I've done this. Uh, my job as a programmer is done. I now just need to say wire. Um, you can say package name. I'll just assume the present directory. Let's see here. So we have a problem, first of all. Um, it doesn't know how to find this string. Uh, and if you look, uh, look at our various initializers. Our first one here, new message wants a string. And wire saying, of all these various dependencies, you know, I understand how events going to come out, but at the very top of it, I need a string. What am I going to do about that? Um, so let's see here. Uh, what should we do? Um, let's start by just saying, um, let's just put it here. Let's put our message there, and we'll say, uh, welcome gophers, or welcome to Boulder gophers, right? Uh, we'll change our signature here. So um, now we're making sure that the invocation has all the various data. So this is where you can think like, you know, my API passwords, my connection string for my database, uh, whatever, whatever kind of things that you wouldn't want to be hard coding into your into your application code. Um, and then I've uh, added it here. So now Wire's smart enough to say, oh, I see this message coming in, I see this event going out, I have these initializers, I see how all these types line up. I'm going to kind of like line them all up and build up the initialization code myself. So I ran Wire. Um, you'll notice here that I have a Wire gen. Uh, let's take a look at that. Uh, let's close this. Let's look at Wire gen. Uh, and here's what Wire's done. It's looked at your dependency graph, or the R dependency graph, rather, and it's put all the pieces together. Now, uh, I don't really understand why it's putting two here. I should, uh, I should ask why that two is there. But uh, other than that, this more or less looks like the code that we would have written if we had to write it by hand, right? Um, and that's one of the big, the big important things to take away. You like wire, you use it. In a month or two, you realize, God, I hate this tool. I wish I hadn't used it. Well, guess what? Stop using it, throw it away, and you've still got your code. Like there's no like, you commit to wire now and you're forever stuck with it. Like you can just walk away whenever you want. Uh, which again, is somebody who's like a little suspicious of third party dependencies, I like that. Uh, and that's one, of the, that's one of the goals of wire, to be producing code that looks more or less like what you would have written yourself now. Of course, if you were keeping this in your app, you'd probably get rid of these uh, suffixes here, but nonetheless, it's produced that. 
Now, I want to uh, uh, draw attention to something else. We have some build constraints here. So, um, the other piece that we want to uh, set up to make this work is to add a build constraint over here. So, what we'll do is we'll say, um, we'll just do the inverse. So, this is saying, don't build this when you're asking for wire inject. Uh, and this is saying build this when you're asking for wire inject. That way, we can make sure that this code doesn't get included in the final binary. I mean, of course, we're going to have a problem. Um, let me uh, let me take out. Oops, oops. Let me take out that build constraint and show you what the problem is first. So we run go but build, um, and immediately we have a problem because we've got this initialize event twice. Well, here's one, um, and here's two. So uh, that's where the um, the build constraint comes in handy. We can build it, and then uh, the Go toolchain says, "Oh, I see that you have these two like alternate tags. One saying yes, one saying no. Uh, I'm going to automatically take the um, the good one, this initialize event here, and then we have our greeter here, and there it is. It works. So um, that's kind of a very basic example. Um, let's let's look at a second thing here. So all is fine and good." Uh, but then we realize, well, you know, um, we have some error code. We know that our uh, initialize event might fail in some cases. Well, for those of us who've handwritten that code, we now have to potentially like propagate an error back up, you know, so many calls. Uh, wire, however, makes life pretty nice. So I'm going to say, um, you know, the usual. If error is not equal to nil, uh, by the way, if you're sick of writing these, uh, I would urge you to all look at the. Um, what are they called? Design docs for error handling. Uh, the Go team is very interested in making it such that Go programs have a reason to stop complaining about this. So if you have opinions about this and you haven't read about the design docs, I would urge you to go, um, uh, you can Google it. It's a couple blog posts down on the Go blog. So uh, we'll just say uh, fatal. Well, let's do fatal F. Failure. So there's our failure. Um, so now uh, the hand-rolled crowd are thinking, oh great, I've got to propagate this error in the database connection way back up through all these initializers. That's going to be really painful. Uh, but fortunately, uh, life's not so bad in the wire, the wire world. So we can just do that. Uh, I guess we have to do this too. This is just a compile check. Uh, it doesn't, this is kind of garbage. You, don't, you can ignore this. Um, so we do that. Um, now the other thing we probably want to do is maybe make sure that our... Uh, error here. Let's see, our new event has um, an error return. I could put this all the way at the bottom, but uh, for now I'm just going to put it here. Oops, not it. No. Um, and then let's say we just have a failed event, so we're going to all return error is new. Failed event. So we have that right now. Now presently, if we look at our wire gen, it's not going to compile, right? So you can run wire again, or you can run go generate. Uh, nope, looks like there's some module problems. Uh, wrong number of return values, got one. So let's look at 45. Um, what's the deal with this? Just a second here. So we've got our setup here. That looks good. Uh, our initializer is happy. Yep, that's good. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Jeez. Um, thanks, Brian. So uh, we wire it. We come up here. Uh, and then you can see that wire's rewritten this initializer for us and done the right thing. So you can imagine that this world would be quite nice if uh, you know your error is deep down the chain or you just can't be bothered to rewrite this massive initializer. Um, and so on. So uh, that's wire. Uh, let me show you the readme here. There's a couple more interesting things. So if you've if you if you dabbled in dependency injection in Java land, um, there are ways to, for instance, bind an interface to a type. So for instance, if somebody asks for a stringer, you can always give it a you know this type instead of that type. Um, you can bind to, to values and so on. There's this advanced feature section for you to look at. But uh, in effect, I've taken you through wire. I mean, that's really about it. It's, it's, it's that simple. It's code generation um, that makes dependency injection design and initialization and changes much easier. Uh, so that's all I've got. I think I've been talking for, I don't know, what, 15 minutes? I, I broke my watch, so I don't know. <laughs>
Um, that's it. If there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy to take them. But uh, just kind of generally in conclusion, this is like a tool. It might solve your problem. It might not. And again, I urge you, if it helps you, use it. If it doesn't, <coughs> keep going on about your day. So questions? Uh, I had that? a question because uh, you listed uh, all, when when you were making the initializer, they were all different types. How does wire work, or does wire work well? Like if you have multiples of the same type that are required in the initializer. Let's uh, let's find out. Can you think of how we can change this? How should we change this? So if we had two initializers that both produced a message, for instance, yeah, is that is that kind of like what you're thinking? Yeah. Um, I think in this case, um, you would provide it here. Uh, I mean, this is where, for instance, if you said, let's say you had a, a new message and a new sponsored message, for instance, mm -hmm. um, but they both produced a message, um, you'd probably want to think about like who's consuming it downstream. I think in, in the advanced features here, there are ways to bind. Um, you might want to you might want to change your design a little bit, such that you could use interfaces, for instance, and say if anybody asks for a fooer, then give them you know this this foo, for instance. You can see there's this bind call. Uh, give them, if anybody asks for a fooer, then I want to give them a bar. Um, foo and bar are like the worst things to understand, but you know, <laughs> if somebody asks for a sponsored message, then give them this, or you know, a, an annoying marketing message, then give them a sponsored message, uh, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> there's also struct providers, so there's a number of additional tools here that I think will allow you to adjust, but. Uh, so it would recognize like if you had it in an interface, that's how you could get away with having like things that are basically the same, but still different. I think so, uh, but then again, there are there are uh, some good error messages. So, for instance, if we said func uh, new other message, let's just look at the error here. I think uh, uh, wire is going to get confused. Uh, we'll just return a zero message, for instance. So, let's see your new other message. Oops, new other message, and we run wire here. It's going to say, well, wait a second. I don't understand this. So th this is where you might have to think about your design. Um, okay. you, don't, you might also want to think about like there's a there's an idea of like provider. Let's see here, provider sets. I mean, so there's more there's more details than I went into here, but there's ways to group initializers. So you can say this is my one group for creating my sponsored content. This is my one group for creating my like. You know, don't give me any marketing talk. Just tell me straight content. You know, whatever. Um, so uh, yes, that's a good question. Uh, does there happen to be uh, any project that you know of that's you know, that's out there in open source that has been using this for some period of time? Uh, the one the one that I know of is there's this thing called Go Micro, which is it's, if you've heard of uh, Go Kit, for instance, it's comparable in some ways to Go Kit. I think Go Micro is using um, no, sorry, that's Go Cloud. Uh, no, I don't. I don't know of anybody using Wire presently. Again, it only came out in uh, yeah, it's pretty good. July, and it's still it's still pretty young. So, for instance, as you're using this, like you might find bugs. So, uh, part of this is a call for like if this is something interesting to you, and you use it, and you find problems, Are there like any uh, pull or, uh, issues or pull requests online. Let's There's take a, a look. Because anybody anybody that's opened multiple issues is probably using it. So a lot of this is these are these are this is a picture of Robert. That's Ross. You know, there's these look like they're core team people. Well, let's see, zombies in. I think these a lot of them might be internal people. So I'm not sure the usage is like off the charts right now. But again, it's a young library. Um, it solves a problem for very big dependency sure. graphs. So you know, like the the people who this would be a perfect fit for are already kind of like maybe a little smaller. But uh, uh, that's a long way of saying no. I don't know. So uh, thanks for giving this talk. I think this is really useful. Um, <clears throat> we actually have some questions from the internet. Oh wow! Um, Great. <clears throat> so uh, wh what is the roadmap for Wire, and are they looking for parity in uh, Dagger two? I'm not familiar with that uh, project, um, but uh, they mentioned that. And uh, how do how would you want to be similar or differ? different to Dagger 2? Uh, those are all fantastic questions. So I suspect, judging from the question that, um, let's see here, is it stated here? I think uh, it's that the reference to Dagger is this Java dependency framework. Um, I think it was mentioned in, in this post at the beginning, perhaps. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, there's, there's the reference to Dagger right there. Um, I think uh, in terms of like parity with Dagger, um, I mean, as a Go developer, I hear dependency injection framework and I think, nope, don't want it. 
And I think the, the, core, the team that's building this is aware that they don't want to just bring a bunch of Java patterns and plop them into Go. Uh, I think the hope here is um, to produce a tool that's useful, but it's also idiomatic Go. Like, it's based on Go Generate. Um, now, again, this is based on my own understanding. I think the real question would be to open an issue um, and bring this up, because I think the, the, the team would be very interested to hear this and answer it themselves, because uh, I'm not a member of this team. I've just been supporting it. Um, I don't think parity with Dagger 2 is a, is a, is a, a design goal. It's more of like Dagger 2 is an inspiration, uh, but idiomatic, making an idiomatic tool is the, uh, the first concern. Uh, in terms of roadmap, I think it's more like try it, see what you think, uh, let us know what doesn't work, let us know what does work. Uh, it's still very early stage. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, some other questions. Um, is there any runtime dependency for Wire? And uh, uh, does it handle cyclical dependencies? Uh, so both of those are good questions. Uh, runtime dependency uh, is is the probably the best thing here. Um, I mean, you can see here that this little stub that we've built here does import wire, but if you look at the wire gen, I mean, file name aside, there's no reference to wire here whatsoever. So it's not about there's zero runtime dependency on wire. So you know you can imagine workflow of you run go generate, you get your you get your result, you make some changes, you run go generate, you get your result, and then one day somebody rolls on the team and says we don't like this wire, we're getting rid of it. Well, guess what? Uh, delete the sub, you're done. Like there's no big refactoring, no like pulling the thing out of uh, out of the code base. Uh, which, for instance, if you did that in um, uh, a Java um, application that was using dependency framework, oh goodness, uh, it's not just pull the thing out. It's more like we need to talk about a rewrite. Um, so that's that's one of the big things that I think Wire is going to uh, continue to be like a, a tool that doesn't impose any kind of runtime de um, demands on you. It's just a tool for generating code. Uh, there was another question in there about cyclical dependencies. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Um, I would hope that we could avoid cyclical dependencies. I think generally that's like uh, that's kind of a naughty uh, a naughty problem. If you can avoid it, best avoid it. Um, but let's find out. Let's see if we can let's see if we can make a cyclical dependency here. So maybe uh, how would we do this? Um, what sh what shall we do? What kind of uh, change shall we make here? So let's say message needs to have a reference to the event, for instance. Um, so we'll say uh, event, and we'll pass in an event. Let's see, e is event. For whatever reason, I don't know. You know, maybe maybe it needs a, an event. Um, and then uh, and that's got a location. And that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a fair that's a fair uh, a fair thing to say. Totally. So our uh, oops, not that. Our wire .go, you know, has everything it needs to do to get started. Um, Real quick, while we're here, what what is the import? How is the import actually used there? Uh, that's a good question. It's right here. It's this call to build. Uh, but again, this is the stub. So you know, if that if that makes you nervous, I mean, I'm always a little suspicious of third party dependencies, and I think it's good to be that way. It just seems odd that they would they would need to have a dependency here when the, when it's. I mean, they could just have that be a comment or something. That's a good question. Uh, you know, in fact, I would even open that issue. Maybe like a wire build there and say new message. Yeah. That, that's a very great. That's a very good point. And uh, if that issue is not already open, it should be. So I'd encourage you to open that issue. That's a very good point. Uh, so anyway, we have our cyclical dependency. Let's see what happens. Uh, so no. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. Cycle Yeah. The error. The error is. Uh, I mean, Go doesn't allow it. Yeah. I actually had a question on my own. Um, I noticed that it was in the GoCloud tree. Um, I imagine uh, there's plenty of projects that aren't interested in doing any cloud things that might want to use Wire. Yep. Is there any plan of extracting it out so it's less tied to GoCloud? Uh, there's a very issue for that. And uh, let's see here. Um, proposal to separate Wire into its own module and own repository. So yes, here's here's an issue. Um, I think the team's entirely in favor. Uh, if you can look, Robert's opened another issue in the past that I think is referenced by this one. Um, I think the initial design thoughts were like, let's get wire was initially seen as a great way to like set up the world on AWS, set up the world on GCP, set up the world on Azure, uh, and then make that process very easy to switch between them. 
Uh, but now that now that there's been feedback from the community, it's it's and that the project's out there, it's a little easier to make changes. Or rather, there aren't these massive changes that have to touch everything, so it's much more feasible to pull wired out. I think it was more just like a pragmatic way of like saying, uh, we're going to be making massive changes as we're developing, and we don't want to have to be doing like uh, coordinated commits across repos. But uh, I think there's a strong interest in pulling this out. In fact, uh, JBA is assigned to, to do that very work. So I, I would guess it's happening. I haven't, I haven't read the uh, updated stuff, but the interest is there. Yes. I, I, I know your, your response is going to be go up an issue for this, but it just, uh, I'm just going to think it out loud here. Um, it seems like yeah, you, you start out with this little stub, but the stub is, is really just throw away. As soon as you bootstrap it yourself, mm -hmm. it seems like you know if, if Wire just got rid of this little stub that we need to write and, and still and, and just did everything with a go generate, uh, what, what's the term? Invocation. What's that? Just like the invocation itself. You would well, just, the, the, just the, the comment, you know, you do slash slash go colon generate and you put a whole bunch of, uh, you know, you put all kinds of... Uh, yeah, you're, I need a this and I need a that and right. find this here and yeah. so on. And then, and then you don't need this at all, you just, all you have to do is go update that go. That's a great, go that's a great point. There is a go generate in your main, right? Um, if you look in the, the wire gen here, the idea okay. is that you bootstrap with wire and then subsequent yeah. uh, so calls can be just after that, and that, that could just be, you know, that's all you ever need to do is, is update those parameters. It's, it's a good point. Um, you're right, I'm going to say raise the issue. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe the team's already thought about it and they've already realized why they can or it's on the radar or whatever, but it's a good point because honestly, um, it'd be nice not to have to have an import path on a tool inside the library. Again, you know, you don't have to necessarily commit this stub either, but, um, you know, it's nice to have all the things in one place. So. Uh, I would mention one good thing about having an import there is that uh, Go modules were included as a dependency. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which I think is one of the big driving points of this, like, let's split wire out. Um, when you do that, you get all this. Which is obviously not um, wire. You know, a lot of open census has nothing to do with wire. For instance, Gorilla Mux has nothing to do with wire. Jason, to your point, though, isn't there some some precedent for having Go generate tools that aren't in your import pack? Yeah, they, they recommend. I think it's like doing like a tools.go file in your yeah. mount module root, and then you list all your imports in there, just underscore them out, and then that way uh, when you uh, pull down a project, the module system pulls it down on your tool dependencies as well. That's cool. Yeah, yeah it's a good point, though. Um, and if it's not already open, I hope to see it soon. Yes? I was going to ask if you show the uh, function signature for build. Absolutely. Well, you know, I think, um, I don't know if I, oh, it works. Yeah, there it is. So, empty interface, you know, I don't know that, but. So, is this just. Is this just meant to get some AST down so that they can then manipulate AST into, okay. Yeah, in fact, if you look uh, at the readme, there are, um, there's an alternate syntax, which, which when, we were, when we were working on like presenting this to the world, was like the syntax that everyone used or that all the examples had. And personally, I found it like um, a little hard to uh, swallow. It's like a panic, a call to panic. Uh, yeah, there you go. This is an alternate syntax. but. Um, I guess it's not totally related. That, that makes me very nervous when I see that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think it's purely like just a hook that it can grab onto, which maybe it could be a hook and then go generate comment, you know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the internals of wires as well as I should be. So, thanks a lot. Um, again, I'm, uh, let's see here, I'm you know, at Google, so if you want to have lunch, you want to hang out, want to talk about Go, want to tell me like why Go could be better, I want to know about it. Um, oh, and uh, I'm working on nowadays, let's see, not this Go Cloud, but Google Cloud Platform. Uh, I'm one of the maintainers of this repo now, which is a daunting task, because this is every single like call into uh, Google Cloud. One of the maintainers, the junior one, um, fortunately. Uh, so if you have something you don't like about this, or you haven't tried it out, try it out. And if something's broken, uh, get in touch. I'd love to know about it. I'd love to help you fix it. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff on Google Cloud. So thanks a lot, everybody.